Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. Well, hello, Known Victory Church. So excited again uh, to be speaking this morning. And today I actually have the privilege of preaching uh, two places at once. Right now I'm actually preaching at the exact same time in McLennan, Alberta with our Victory Church there with pastors uh, Todd and Emma Moore. And we're just finishing up our youth conference that we've been at all weekend. And it's been an incredible, incredible weekend. And before we dive into the final message of the series uh, that we've been going through called The Lord's Prayer, I want to give a little bit of a recap on what we've talked about um, over the month of January. And so we've been going through uh, The Lord's Prayer, which comes in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9 to 13, which is when Jesus is, is, uh, is teaching uh, on the mountain, Sermon on the Mount. And this is what he says when the disciples say, how do we pray? He says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. So we started week one, beginning of January. We started with the message, Our Father. And the Lord's Prayer starts when Jesus teaches us to pray. It starts by him telling us who we're praying to. So when we start praying, we, we need to be praying to our Father who art in heaven. And then we go into how great and amazing he is, how much he loves us and wants relationship with us. Because prayer always starts with an understanding on who we are praying to, our Father. And our takeaway, you know, for that was prayer is connecting to our Holy Father. And then the week after, we went into the next message called Your Will. You know, Jesus, he then teaches us, after he teaches us who we're praying to, he teaches us then who, sh who should have authority in our lives. We pray this part to put our hope and to put our future in his hands rather than trying to carry the weight on our own. It keeps his vision and his love in front of us because we are declaring his ways are better and his ways are higher than our ways. Teaching us to follow his voice, follow his leading, to make his desires our desires. And the takeaway was his kingdom is better than my kingdom and his will is greater than my will. And then we went into the next message which was called daily bread. And this teaches us to trust him with our tomorrow, to not worry about tomorrow, but to pray about everything and not worry about anything as we pray about everything, to not worry about what it's gonna look like in our future. And this prayer grows our faith and, know, and we know that God is gonna take care of our deepest needs and we pray this every single day. Give us today the food we need. need. Give us today our daily bread and we turn to him as our provider uh, and we sit back and watch him do the miraculous. And our takeaway uh, was praying, give us our daily bread, teaches us to be content, to be faithful, and to teaches us the miraculous. And then we went in uh, to the next message, which was called forgive us. And he teaches us, as Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us that when God forgives us, it is our responsibility to show the same grace, the same compassion, the same love towards people who have wronged us and hurt us. And when we don't forgive, it isn't a salvation issue, but it just doesn't allow us into the fullness of who God is, that our forgiveness is directly tied to the same forgiveness that we show. And our takeaway was, who do I need to forgive this week? And then today we're gonna be closing, uh, finishing uh, this series with the last part of this prayer. And this is what it is. Matthew 6, 13, and it says, don't, and don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. I find it interesting that this is how, when Jesus teaches us to pray, he ends it with this. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And different translations say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
And so I wanna go through this last verse together, and I think there's so much in it, and I wish I had more time, but, but there's so much in this. And the first part of this last prayer is lead us. The biggest question I think we have to ask when we think about this prayer, when we pray this prayer, when we think about Jesus teaching this prayer, is we have to ask the question, who or what is leading me? Who or what is leading you right now? And I think the things that lead a lot of us when we look at our society, when we look at our culture, the things that lead a lot of us right now is protection and gratification. I think a lot of the time what we're pursuing is the things that are gonna keep us the safest, the things that are gonna make us the most comfortable. We're also pursuing the things that are gonna bring us the most gratification, even if it's temporary, even if it's, if it's synthetic, even if it's not real. We're searching for, for gratification and protection. And these things, you know, gratification, protection, are, are in, a, in and of itself, they're good, but they are horrible leaders. You know, if, if gratification, if protection is leading our life, if we're following uh, these things, it's going to cause a lot of problems in our life. And we know this because we've seen it, right? We've seen so many people pursuing uh, gratification, pursuing things that are going to give them joy or dopamine, you know, in a moment. And then end, we end, they end up getting to the end of their life and they've realized that they've missed out on so much. They had all the toys, they had everything, they had the, the small uh, gratification, but at the end they realized they were left with nothing. And protection and gratification can, can and they will destroy your life if, if they become your leader. You know, we have to really pay attention on who is leading us. Who is it or what is it that is leading you? Because whatever we, whatever's leading us means we're following it. So if we're following gratification, we're constantly going to be going where we can find gratification. Whether it's right or wrong, that's what we're going to be pursuing. We're going to be pursuing the thrill. We're going to be pursuing the things that make us happy. But the reality is it will lead us to a life of tragedy and a life of despair. As they lead us into temptation and not away from temptation. They put us in situations that will cause us to stumble and cause us to fall. And when we pray, lead us, we are setting ourselves up in the posture of a follower. When we pray, lead us, we're saying, I am going to follow you wherever you lead me. He is our leader. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And we need to follow him. Who is it or what is it in your life that you're following? And I think in North America, in culture, when it comes to being a Christian, we've, we've kind of diminished what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. And what we do is we, we've kind of diminished it to believing in him. And believing in him, of course, is very true in John three sixteen, right? For God, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his, own, his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And this is probably the most famous scripture in the Bible, because you see celebrities posting this. You see celebrities having it tattooed across their chests, on their arms. They, they, this is what we believe. Because, of course, believing in Jesus is when we find eternal life. And we see this all over culture, whether it's in church or whether, whatever. We see it everywhere we go. John 3, 16. Because we love that verse, which is a beautiful reminder of the true sacrifice that God made for us to have eternal life. But believing in Jesus is just scratching the surface of relationship with him. In fact, we often ignore what Jesus said in Matthew, which answers this question, what does following Jesus cost? And in Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up my cross and follow me. You know, we've diminished being, following Jesus, we've kind of diminished it just believing in him. There's a difference between believing in him and following him. It's, it's different to believe he exists, to believe he's good, than to actually follow him wherever he's leading us. What or who is leading you in your life? It isn't free to be a follower of Jesus. Just like salvation costs something. Following Jesus is going to cost us something. 
It costs the father the most valuable thing himself, his son, to, to go to the cross, his only begotten son. The reason many of us choose to not follow Jesus, just believe in Jesus, is because of the cost. You know, following Jesus might cost us some friends. You know, following Jesus might cost us some habits. Following Jesus might cost us something that we actually love, something that we value, something that's bringing us gratification, something that's bringing us protection. We might be following those things, and if we shift to following Jesus, we're going to have to sacrifice something. We're going to have to let go of something. But the beauty is, is that the rewards far outweigh the sacrifice. And we see this in this next question of what does following Jesus give us? And this comes in John 10, 10, right? It says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. See, when we follow Jesus, we turn away from everything the world has to offer that will ultimately destroy us and it, it, we think it's going to be satisfying. We think we're going to be protected. We think we're going to find gratification. But we realize that those things are so synthetic. They're not real. They don't, they don't last. But Jesus says, no, I've come to give you life. I've come to make you, give you a rich and satisfying life. We're not talking about money. We're talking about purpose. We're talking about passion. When we give up the things that, that, that we've been following, when we give up the things to lay down our life for Jesus, that's when we're going to find the satisfying life. That's when we're going to find a life that has protection and has gratification, but without the side effects. Right, you know, we think that, that 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 following Jesus is just like a bunch of rules we have to follow. No, it's a life that's that's going to be satisfying. It's going to be abundant. It's going to be full of life. You know, the side effects of protection and gratification is pain and regret and fear, but the side effects of following Jesus is abundant life, satisfying life. And again, protection and gratification—they're not inherently bad, yet they are terrible leaders. When we follow the king, when we follow Jesus, when we say, God, lead us, we're giving up everything to be following him wherever he leads us. Because that's the safest place. That's the most satisfying place. That's the most abundant place. That's the most gratifying place we can be is following our savior, following our creator. Lead us. When we let him lead us, we will have a full an abundant life, full of purpose, full of passion, and full of life. And number two, as we continue on, the next part says, yield, do not, like, lead us not into temptation. Don't let us yield to temptation. We are asking him not to let us yield to temptation, to lead us away from temptation, to give us what we need, the courage, the strength to not fall into temptation. You know, and the word yield has two definitions. It has two definitions. One is produce or provide, right, in agriculture. When you're growing, what's the yield of your crop? And then number two is to give way to arguments, demands, or pressure. That's what yield means. And I think this prayer, when we say, do not let us yield to temptation, it's so powerful because I think we're asking a few things. We're saying, one, we're saying, don't let us produce temptation for other people. We're saying don't let us fall victim to the arguments or demands of the world. And don't let us give way to the pressure from the world or the enemy to do what we know we shouldn't do. When we're saying lead us not into temptation, do not let us yield to temptation. We're saying God, help me be, help me be humble. Help me know when I'm unsafe. Help me know the dangers. Help me know the safest, the, the, the best way, the way that's going to bring life. Help me know. Because yielding to temptation, I think we all know this because we've all lived this. You know, whenever we yield to temptation or whenever we give in to temptation, usually the first response we have after is shame. You know, the first response oftentimes after is not joy. It's not life. Oftentimes it's death. It's shame that will try to destroy us, that will try to destroy you. This is what falling into temptation does in our life. 
You know, a mortal regret that comes that makes us look back in disgust at our actions toward ourselves or look back at disgust and how we treated people or how we talked about God or how we talked to God. We look back with regret and shame. See, the enemy, he wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to kill you. His mission statement is literally to steal, kill, and destroy your life. And I think, I honestly think, and I don't, I'm not going to hell, but I think if I was to go and I saw in the lobby, I bet you right on the wall, it would say, we exist to steal your future, destroy your relationships, and ultimately kill you. That's what he would say on his wall, because that's what he's about. He's about destroying you, and he'll do whatever it takes to try and make that happen. He's going to do whatever it takes to destroy your future, to steal your life, to kill you. That's his mission. That's his plan. That's his purpose, is to destroy your life. And he will do whatever it takes to kill you. He will do whatever it takes to destroy you. He doesn't care the cost. He doesn't care what you need. He doesn't care what you want. He doesn't care that it hurts. He does not care about you. He doesn't want you in the picture anymore. And he does this by distracting you. He does this by filling you with fear. He does this to make you doubt. He will try and meet your needs with something shiny only to have it destroy your life. And I think so many of us have been so impacted by the times we fell into temptation and we look back with so much regret and so much shame. We all know the effects that falling into temptation has. Each and every one of us have moments that we can look back on where this is exactly what happened. You know, why the enemy uses temptation is because it works, right? It works. Temptation works. It works because our bodies are fighting our spirits. We know what is right. I think, I think the reality is most of us as humanity, we truly desire to be good. We truly want to do good. And yet I think we all also know that doesn't always happen. We don't always do the right thing. We don't always fight against temptation. We don't always see the victory that we wish we would see in our decision making, in, our, in the moments of our deepest fear and doubt and distraction. We don't always make the decision that we wish we would. And in, in, in 1 Peter 5, 8 is what it says. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The enemy wants to destroy you. And he will use temptation to get you there, to try and get you to a point. He's going around like a roaring lion looking for for somebody to devour, looking for someone who's struggling, looking for somebody, because that is his mission. He wants to destroy you. So when we pray, don't let us yield to temptation or don't lead or lead us not into temptation. We are reminding ourselves that we have an enemy and we are asking God to give us the strength, give us the courage we need to push against the temptation that will come. If anyone knows temptation, It's Jesus, right? If you know when you look at the account of him, he's led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's where he was led. But as the writer of Hebrews looks back on the life of Jesus on earth, this is what he says in Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16. So then, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness. For he faced all the same testings or all the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. See, Jesus fully understands our temptations. In fact, he faced the exact same temptations, the exact same testings that we do, yet he did not yield to temptation. He did not enter into the trap of temptation in his life. Temptation will come, but temptation in itself isn't wrong. It's what temptation yields. It's what temptation produces. That's the problem. What temptation really is, is temptation is anything that shifts our eyes away from our leader, Jesus. The one who's leading us, as soon as we look away, we're distracted and we start to pursue the wrong things. They might be good things, but they're the wrong things. 
and we, we get distracted. And so we look around and we look around and we don't know what's happening. I know for us, you know, we have a little dog at home named Brady. And we go for walks sometimes and it's, she's just always all over the place. It's hard for her to, you know, walk straight because she's getting distracted by the bunnies and distracted by the birds and distracted by everything around her that she sometimes loses focus of what's in front of her. It's the same with our daughter, the same thing. We go for a walk and she's all over the place, picking flowers, running in the grass, rolling in the grass, falling over, pushing the stroller. She's so distracted by everything around her. And really what temptation is, it's, it's anything that's gonna make us lose focus of our father, lose focus of the one leading us through the wilderness. Temptation is like, is like that. That's exactly what it is. That's what it'll do in our lives. We pray, lead us not into temptation. We say, help. Help us not fall into temptation. Help me not give into temptation. Keep me on the right path, looking forward in the right direction. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Sometimes in our temptation, we feel like we're the only one who can be struggling. It says, no, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. The only way out of temptation is Jesus. The only way out is following God through. He's the only one who will show you the way out. We cannot overcome temptation on our own. We are asking God to give us the strength, give us the courage we need to overcome, to give us a way out, to help us not fall, to help us not yield to to temptation, to help me see the way out. Open my eyes so I can see the way out out of this. Help me follow you. Help me not get distracted, not give in to the things that try and weigh me down. Help me not fall into temptation. Give me patterns. Give me routines. Give me habits. Help me be disciplined to say no. Help us as we combat the constant fight for our souls. Lead us not into temptation. Give me the strength to say no. Give me the strength I need to make it out. Give me life. We pray, I don't want my life to be tarnished. I don't want my life to be broken due to a lack of discipline. We ask God to lead us out of temptation. And then the last part of this prayer is rescue us, right? Rescue us. And this part of the prayer I find so humbling and vulnerable. Because what it is, is we're admitting we need a savior. What it is, is that we're admitting we need someone to rescue us. Someone to deliver us. Someone to come in and make sure we're okay. What we're saying in this prayer is we're saying, I'm not enough. We're saying, I can't do it on my own. We're saying, I need you. I need rescuing. And Paul wrote about this in the book of Romans. Romans 3, 23 to 24. For everyone has sinned. We fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. You know, Jesus is the answer to the problem. Jesus is our rescuer. We say, rescue us. And how the Father did this, how God did this, he sent Jesus, right? He's our savior. He's our rescuer. He is what will save us. He won't let us drown. He won't let us fall. He will be there to pick us up when we doubt, even when we do yield to temptation. He loves us so deeply that he will never abandon you. He will never abandon us. He will never forsake us. He took the penalty for us. He goes to the cross instead of us. He is our rescuer. When it comes to temptation, our prayer every day has to be this. God, lead me not into temptation and deliver me, rescue me. That's a humbling and vulnerable place to go. To say, I need a savior. I need to be rescued. I need to be saved. 
right? Because each day has enough trouble of its own. We need to pray this daily. Lead us daily. We can't get sidetracked. We can't lose sight of him. You know, each day, again, has enough trouble of its own. And as we pray this each day, you know, we're refocusing on him as our leader. We're not only believing in him, but we're also following him. We are laying down our lives to follow. We are sacrificing our will to follow. We are sacrificing our wants, our desires to follow. Now, following Jesus will lead you to a life that is full, a life that is full of protection and full of gratification. But it's real, it's not fake. A life full of protection, full of gratification, but without the negative side effects. That's when we pray, God, lead me not into temptation. Help me not yield to temptation and rescue me. Deliver me from the evil one. Rescue me. So we all need a savior. You know, our, our takeaway today is this, is that following Jesus requires sacrifice, but it gives us a full life and an abundant life. Yes, following Jesus is a sacrifice. Yes, it might be challenging, but it gives you a full life. It gives you an abundant life. As we learn to pray the way Jesus taught us, let us remember how beautiful it is. You know, Jesus, as he lays it out, is, a, is almost a template when it comes to prayer. And, you know, Pastor Andy Stanley, you know, a big pastor, um, he, he kind of writes it out like this. He says this, when you pray, address God as the Father, declare his greatness, surrender your will, and acknowledge your dependence on him. Our dependence for provision, give us to stay our daily bread, for pardon, forgive us, and lead us not into temptation, protection, provision, pardon, and protection. This is how we pray. This is the formula. This is the template. If you want to learn how to pray, address God as Father, declare His greatness, surrender your will, and acknowledge your dependence for provision, pardon, and protection. We have to know who we're talking to. We have to understand His value. We have to know who He is. We have to sacrifice our will for His, and we have to acknowledge that we need him. This should be our daily prayer. So I wanna pray for us. And as I pray, I'm just gonna pray the Lord's Prayer and then I'm gonna pray over all of us, pray a blessing over us as we learn to pray, as Jesus continues to teach us to pray. But let this be our prayer. So our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So God, that is our prayer. Help this be our daily prayer that we address you and we know you as our Father, not just, not just a God, you are our Father. So help us address you that way. Help us understand how great you are, how amazing, how beautiful you are and how amazing your name is. Help us be willing to surrender our will for yours. Help us be willing to give up our will for your will. And help us also understand that we need you to provide. We need your pardon and we need your protection. That is our prayer moving forward. And so God, I thank you that you're showing us, you're leading us. God, help us be not just believe in you, but help us follow you as well. Follow you wherever you might lead us into the full, abundant, and beautiful life. In Jesus' name, amen.